Hi everybody and welcome back to another episode of I Am Journal Club. Today we will talk about the second most voted for topic in our recent poll, a meta-analysis of doxycycline for community-acquired pneumonia that was recently published in Clinical Infectious Diseases. Our guest is Dr. Brad Spellberg, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center. Dr. Spellberg is also a Professor of Clinical Medicine and the Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at the Tate School of Medicine. Let's jump right in. Uh, Dr. Spellberg, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me. So you have been involved in a number of interesting uh, projects, uh, including advocating for the new antibiotic mantra, Shorter is Better, and leading to uh, uh, and, and also leading a systematic review, or is the new IV, which made a nice uh, comparisons uh, of regimens for bacteremia, infective endocarditis, and, and also myelitis. Now you're working on addressing the process uh, with which guidelines are uh, created. Um, it's called Wiki Guidelines, and you call for the incorporation of more uh, humility of uncertainty into the guidelines. Uh, if I could ask you a personal question, what made you sort of uh, work on this? I've been frustrated personally with the guidelines for many years. And the more lectures that I've given, frankly, all over the world, the more the comment has been has been made to me after my talks. Well, you make a lot of good points. The data clearly show something, but I can't do that because the guidelines don't say to. And so there's frustration all over with the guidelines. And and the the one anecdote I could tell you a billion of them, but the one that's maybe most dramatic is that when I was a a resident, and we had our primary care clinics that we rotated through and had our own patients assigned to us. I put all of my patients who were postmenopausal on hormone replacement therapy because the national guidelines said you need to put patients on hormone replacement therapy to prevent breast cancer. And then a couple of years later, when I was an ID fellow, the large women's health initiative randomized control trial was published. And oops, it turns out hormone replacement therapy causes breast cancer. How many women did we cause to have breast cancer by following the guidelines? Um, and it made me realize, wow, these people are just making this stuff up. And the thing is, is that when you put a guideline out, it is more than just an opinion. You make a recommendation, payers reimburse based on it. Regulators will cite your hospital for lack of compliance to it. Care pathways and order sets are based on it. MedMal lawsuits are based on it. So it creates a standard of care. And, and there's multiple other examples where guidelines got it dead wrong based on low quality data. And so the point was, let's, let's change how we do this and only make a clear recommendation when we have reproducible prospective control trials to say it's the right thing to do. And for everything else, we can still talk about it, but we'll discuss options. Some people like to do it this way. Here's the rationale for this way. And we don't create a care standard until we know it's the right thing to do. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, uh, guidelines and the evidence uh, behind it uh, today as well. Um, so uh, we have, um, uh, as topic today, we have uh, um, a doctor's cycling for community-acquired pneumonia. And there's a new a systematic review with the meta-analysis of Doxycycline, uh, tetracycline antibiotic versus uh, other uh, monotherapies out there a couple of months ago in clinical infectious diseases. Uh, they did a sensitivity analysis, if I could uh, summarize it that way, for outpatients and inpatients with CAB and also by risk of bias. And the top line results are that they found around six uh, randomized control trials between 1984 and 2010 with a total of 834 patients. Have and have compared with older macrolides uh, and fluoroquinolones, and then four out of six had a, a high risk of bias by the great methodology. And there was no statistically significant difference between uh, doxycycline and any of the comparators for the clinical uh, cure rate as the primary endpoint. And the adverse events were likewise comparable as reported by the authors. I find this an, an interesting topic, and so did the people who voted for the study. Uh, 
in the community t uh, tab on our YouTube channel. However, um, even though that maybe the study is straightforward, uh, I, I find it pretty difficult for um, what to make uh, what to make of it. What about you? So for me, it sort of reinforced what me and and many of the people that I know believe, which is that doxycycline is an excellent lung drug. Uh, it's broad spectrum. It is heavily concentrated intracellularly in the lung. It hits the relevant pathogens, and there is extensive literature now. Now it's it's all observational. Well. It's largely observational, showing that your C. diff risk is much lower with doxy than any other antibiotic you're going to use. So that that one of the principal harms we worry about when we give antibiotics is actually avoided with doxycycline. So I've been good with doxy for pneumonia for a long time. And then um, talking about the guidelines, so in in uh, in the UK, um, I think they do recommend doxycycline monotherapy as an alternative. Uh, for mild and moderate cap uh, in the NICE guidelines. Um, and then in this, the joint ATS and IDSA guidelines, uh, they list doxycycline as a, as an option for outpatient uh, community acquired uh, pneumonia, but um, they uh, it's sort of a provisional, a conditional recommendation with a, a low quality of evidence. Do you think that this low quality of evidence changes with this uh, review for outpatients or are the studies just too old and small? So, so it's a fascinating question you ask, and it gets back to the wiki guidelines concept. That's not low quality evidence. You just quoted six randomized control trials, right? And those go back 30 years. It's not, in fact, here's a fact. There have been two that I'm aware of in the history of human beings, two randomized control trials that compared an antibiotic to placebo for the treatment of community acquired pneumonia. Those were both done in military recruits in the 1960s. Guess which drug they used? Tetracycline. And it worked. It was superior to placebo and they thought it was ethically doable because these were young, healthy people with mild pneumonias that were unlikely to die. They were just knocked out of their training, military training for a couple of weeks and it got them back faster. So we've known since the 60s that tetracyclines are great community acquired pneumonia drugs. Now. I don't think it's a quality of evidence issue. And again, I, as we've discussed, I think the guidelines should be constructed differently. Here are the factors that I think the, the guidelines do sort of intelligently think through. When you first admit a patient to the hospital with community acquired pneumonia, do you know that they're bacteremic or not? Because tetracyclines are not good bloodstream drugs. They have very low levels in blood. If you have a pneumococcal bacteremic pneumonia, None of us would be happy with doxycycline for that patient, right? Oh my God, doxy for a bacteremia? Whoa. The other concern if you go into the ICU is doxy does not have good activity against Legionella, which is the big atypical player in the ICU setting. And so I think the guidelines correctly state, look, you got a really sick patient being admitted to the hospital. You want to know if those blood cultures are negative, the patient's getting better, it's not Legionella, right? Then I think they do give you the option of doxy as an outpatient transition, but they also talk about stewardship. So let's talk about stewardship from the standpoint of preserving drugs. Let's not talk about spectrum of activity because it turns out amoxicillin is a lot broader than people think in terms of the environmental organisms it can kill. But we don't use amoxicillin for very much anymore. And so I think the guidelines kind of appropriately say, if you're worried about pneumococcal pneumonia, it really does hone in on that pathogen. We're not gonna use it for anything else. Doxy, on the other hand, is used for a wide variety of other things. And so there may be a stewardship argument in favor of amoxicillin compared to doxycycline. And there are probably rising rates of resistance in the pneumococcus for doxy. Now, what's that number? 10, 20%, right? So the bottom line is this, most of the time you don't get a bug, right? And frankly, in the majority of those cases, it's probably viral and it probably doesn't matter what antibiotic you use. Um, but if you know what the bug is and it's not resistant, doxy is a perfectly, re and it's not in the blood, you've cleared the bloodstream, doxy is a perfectly reasonable drug to use to treat community acquired pneumonia. And then uh, just to hone in a little bit more on the inpatient side, uh, so for for non-severe uh, cap, 
the um, uh, US guidelines recommend uh, combination therapy, the uh, penicillin with a beta, a beta lactamase inhibitor or a cephalosporin plus uh, a metrolide or fluoroquinone uh, monotherapy. Uh, do you think that doxycycline uh, could have a role in patient two? Yes, I do. Under the same caveats, if you if you are, are, are I mean, the beta lactam is there in case there's bacteremia, right? If I'm worried about Legionella doxy is not a good choice. But if you're just using it to cover mycoplasma or Clavidophila, doxy is perfectly reasonable, even in an inpatient setting. If you go into the ICU, that's where you start worrying: could this be Legionella? Is this a septic bacteremic patient? Maybe doxy is not the best option. It could be an oral transitional option when the patient's better, but it may not be the best option up front. Um, and then in terms of uh, resistance uh, rates, um, uh, so metrolytes also have rising resistance uh, rates, but do you think that uh, doxycycline is actually clinically doing better than what the uh, MIC for tetracycline tet from the microlab tells us? Well, that's a great question. In fact, I think that's true for macrolides as well. Now, the, the, the resistance mechanism that predominates to the macrolides in the United States differs from the predominant resistance mechanism in Europe. In Europe, they tend to have very high level resistance. So the MICs are 256 or 512. In the US, you tend to get the ERM mediated resistance, which is more like 32 micrograms per ml. And the issue for macrolides, interestingly, has been no one has been able to demonstrate increasing failures of macrolide resistant pneumococcal pneumonia in the US treated with the macrolide unless the patient was bacteremic. Because the drug is so heavily concentrated in the lung, even if your MIC is 16 to 32, you probably can still exceed it. Is the same thing true for doxy? I don't know. I haven't seen literature on that, but it is very heavily concentrated intracellularly. So it's possible that that might be true as well. We just don't have good data on that point. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the uh, subset of studies included in this uh, review here, uh, there was a, a small uh, study uh, from 2010 um, uh, the other two studies were uh, of lower quality by their uh, by the author's judgment. Uh, so maybe th that's a hole in, in the evidence uh, in patient uh, care? Everything is relative. Right? The, the benefit of antibiotics for CAP are enormous. So um, if you look at the mortality rate of community-acquired pneumonia, all comers across all age groups, pre-antibiotics, it was 30%. And now it's like 3%, right? <laughs> And so, so we're talking about some nuances here. Is doxy better than clarithro? Like, these are like nuanced things. Like, and the reality is, and there was all these observational studies. People love to cite that macrolides have magical anti-inflammatory properties and improve your mortality, even though they're not killing the bug. That's all hy hypothesis generated. It's all retrospective data. We don't have any prospective randomized controlled trials that show superior outcomes. And in fact, as you point out, in the meta-analysis, things kind of looked better for doxy than the macrolide, which is the opposite of what you would predict based on those observational studies. So what we're doing now is this is why you need a wiki guidelines. We're now talking about the nuances around the edges. The bottom line is give effective antibiotics and you're going to be good which is the perfect effective antibiotic is going to vary by cir circumstance and situation. And then you start thinking, all right, am I worried the patient's bacteremic? What are my resistance rates? Do I have to worry about Legionella? And you sort of put the pieces together, but you, it's not a one size fits all. And doxy definitely has a role to play. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the Edward, Edward's events, uh, maybe there's even uh, an advantage for uh, doxycycline uh, uh, no uh, QTC prolongation as in metrolytes, no black box, black box warnings as in, in the fluoroquinones, and, and you mentioned the lower CDF rates. Uh, could uh, doxycycline even lead to a, a faster cure? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, my suspicion is that all of the antibiotics lead to similar time to resolution of symptoms because the symptoms the duration of symptoms in pneumonia probably relate more to the resolution of inflammation. 
the microbes are, are probably gone within three days, no matter what you use, thereabouts, three days, maybe four max. And the rest, if you're still coughing, you're still, it's just your body's resolving the inflammation in the alveoli and it takes some time. So I actually suspect there probably isn't much difference in time to resolution of symptoms across the drugs. And like you say, it's like you're picking, all right, well, this person's QT baseline is high. This person isn't. Hey, I'm I'm treating a patient in Hawaii. There's a lot of sun exposure. They're going to go out on the doxy and get a sunburn, right? You're going to start to think about these kinds of nuances. I think any effective antibiotic is going to work. Antibiotics work really well. Uh, it sounds like you think there is already a wealth of evidence, but if uh, I were to push you and ask, if there was one RCT that you were to design, what would you test? That's a great question. Um, for pneumonia specifically, mm -hmm. is that your question? I mean, honestly, we have really good trials on the duration now. We know you can orally transition now. We have a bunch of options out there. I probably, if I had to do something, would do a platform study that would allow you to change your question being asked every couple of years as you answered the last one. I, you know, there's a ton of randomized control trials in the community acquired pneumonia space, more than most infections, frankly. And then zooming out to, to all of pneumonia, is there anything that you would like to, uh, you would like our, our viewers and listeners to keep in mind? Yeah, so I, we, we, we touched on this. I think one of the biggest transformations in the treatment of community-acquired pneumonia has been the duration of therapy. So there's now more than a dozen randomized controlled trials. When I was a med student, I was taught you have to get 14 days of therapy for community-acquired pneumonia. Now we know the answer is three to five days. Um, five is probably pushing it, frankly. Um, and that's from a, more than a dozen randomized controlled trials. So the, the mantra is shorter is better. And people were like, well, but that means it's more effective. No, no, no. Shorter is the equally effective and causes less harm. And that's what makes it better. So that the average duration now needs to move to that three to five day window and away from that 10 to 14 day window. Dr. Spelberg, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Here are my five personal takeaways from my conversation with Dr. Spelberg. First, Doxy can be an excellent drug for CAP as it penetrates the lung tissue well. Second, if bacteremia may be possible in a given patient, Doxy or metrolytes for that matter should not be used as a monotherapy. Third, if Legionella is possible, for example ICU players, Doxy should be avoided altogether. Fourth, Doxy's side effect profile might fit many patients' needs well, for example it may lead to less C. diff. And fifth, local resistance patterns are key to choosing antibiotics, and resistance against macrolides in the US but not in Europe, and possibly for Doxy may be less clinically relevant for CAMP than the MICs suggest. Thank you for joining us in Journal Clubbing Our Way Through Internal Medicine. See you in the next episode.